It's just one game. It's an FCS opponent, but I believe BYU's performance against Southern Illinois is going to have Cougar fans feeling a lot better about BYU's chances this season. Let's break it down on Postcast. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first view and or listen of the day. And thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us right here on your original daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. This is a special edition of the podcast. We like to call them postcasts. Uh, we do them after each and every BYU football game, home or away, breaking down whatever we saw. Uh, just literally, it feels like an hour or two after the game, after my radio responsibilities wrap up. And then uh, we get to have your guys' comments on the show as well. So let's dive right in. Big win for BYU as they take care of Southern Illinois 41 to 13, the final, as the Cougars improved to 1 0 on the season. My overall takeaway from this game is Jake Retzloff looks just fine. I know, and I tr- I'm going to probably get some of you commenting on this. It's just one game, Jake. I, I get all of that. But man, kid was 20 of 30, 348 yards, three touchdowns, and more importantly, zero, count them, zero turnovers. What can you quibble with that? QB rating of 197.1? Jake Retzloff looked the part of the guy who won the quarterback battle and do it did so convincingly enough that the BYU coaches, as he mentioned post-game, named him the starter, at least in meetings, 10 or 12 days ago, almost two weeks back. He looked the part of QB1 for BYU. Gary Bohannon, I actually thought he might see some extra time in this game, but he came in a mop-up duty time when BYU had finally pulled away in that fourth quarter. Unfortunately, we did not get to see a chance to see him throw the football, but uh, circumstances being what they were at that point, BYU just seen the game out, and that was uh, his job. I also really liked what I saw in terms of Jake just kind of commanding the field. He had the helmet communications, obviously, getting the play called relayed to him. And uh, there was some confusion, by the way, on the helmet comms side of things. A lot of you wondering, was it actually working? Yes, it works. The issue is there are so few teams, BYU among them, that huddle on a consistent basis in college football that only having one receiver on the field in terms of the transponder that's in Jake's helmet, it's hard for him to relay all the information. It was more like the NFL where teams huddle literally every play and the play call comes in and they relay it to every member of the offense. That'd be a different story. But when you go no huddle and you're looking to the sideline, you're going to continue to see those signs, the, the graphics, the hand signals on the play, play cards, that type of stuff. That's going to still continue to be a part of BYU and what they do. The simple fact of the matter is, is the communication between Aaron Roderick and Jake Retzloff uh, essentially allows for Aaron to kind of pop in his ear and say, hey, Watch for this on this certain play, etc. It's going to be an advantage to have that communication. Same thing with the defense. Even without Jay Hill there, Kalani said that it was Justin Enna who was relaying calls uh, to the middle middle linebacker uh, who obviously has a transponder on, in their helmet on defense. That was Harrison Taggart, Ciali Acera, etc. So I think overall, this was a very, very confident confidence-building win for the BYU football program. Yes, it's an FCS opponent. Yes, it's the easiest game on the schedule for BYU all season long. It gets ramped up next Friday when BYU takes on SMU. There is no argument from me about this maybe being a one-off for BYU, but you can't take anything other away from this game that I think confidence in this BYU team. I talked about wanting to see them win this game 45-13. to I wanted to see 400, 450 total yards. They ended up with 527. I know, and we'll get to the comments here in a moment from you guys. There, some of you are going to be like, "Well, the rush per uh, rush per carry numbers aren't great. Forty-seven carries, 179 yards, and had you not had to kneel down the ball twice at the end of the game, you would have been over 180 yards. 3.8 yards per carry. Yes, I know it's sub four yards per carry, and that's not ideal. But let's re- re- reiterate." 47 carries, folks. BYU got off 77 plays in this game. There were games last year that BYU was trending to getting just barely 50 plays. They doubled up Southern Illinois in time of possession. They did, I think, literally everything I wanted to see BYU do in game one. Is there plenty to clean up? Yes, we'll get to that. We'll dig into that momentarily. What I noticed, I want to see them clean up in the moment. But I don't think you can argue with the performance BYU put on in this game. 
I thought defensively, BYU was absolutely lights out, even without Jay Hill uh, on the sidelines. He was there. He was sitting in a box. He made his way down to the field pregame and also late in the game as well. And from all uh, pictures and video I saw of it, his players were mobbing him, uh, making uh, him feel comfortable. I thought his defense was absolutely awesome. Have we seen that much pressure from BYU on the defensive front in particular in what? It's been five years, it feels like, if not longer than that, since we've seen them get after the quarterback to that level. That was really cool to see. Seven tackles for loss, three QB hits. I don't know how many QB hurries because I didn't see an official number on that come out, but more importantly, two sacks. Those two sacks, everybody, would make up one-fifth, count at one-fifth of the total for 12 games a season ago. BYU mustered just 10 sacks as a team a season ago. Two tonight, uh, speaking of the win over Southern Illinois, was one-fifth of that total. I really liked what I saw from BYU defensively. DJ Williams, yes, he was a scramble threat. He ended up running for 121 uh, yards in this game. But outside of him, really, what threats were there from Southern Illinois? I thought BYU's defense did exactly what it needed, needed to do. It limited SIU to 231 yards, 43 of it that they got on a deep ball that I sh should have been reviewed. It should have been looked at by the officials to determine if he made that catch. But the officials, for whatever reason, allowed the next play to get off, even while Kalani Satake is just running on the field, screaming timeout at the referees. The fact that just a few plays later that SIU was able to call a similar uh, timeout in the very late in a play clock, that type of situation, you know what? It is what it is, but it was not an ideal situation for the officials in this game. I really like the BYU ended up with 6.8 yards per play. That's a very healthy number. Jake Resloff, 11.7 yards per completion. Anything north of 10 yards per completion is actually an elite number by most quarterback metrics out there. So once again, I really really liked what I saw overall from BYU in this game. I was a really, really impressive performance. Darius Lasseter, do we really miss him? Speaking of BYU, not really. And he obviously will only add to an already dangerous, dangerous wide receiving core when he returns next week against SMU after serving an NCAA mandated one game uh, suspension uh, for his uh, waiver of getting the year back this year. No problem. Chase Roberts looked absolutely the part of a lead dog for BYU at wide receiver. I thought that JoJo Phillips, he is showing signs of being a really, really elite talent at that wide receiver position. That deep ball from Jake Retzloff to him, I think it was 57 yards for that touchdown. That was like, okay, the future of the BYU wide receiving core is on display right now because JoJo Phillips, he's still a redshirt freshman. He has got a lot of talent in him. And I, for one, cannot wait to see how he continues to develop because he's got elite size and speed combo. He's six foot five. He's got the speed to really get down the field in a hurry. And I think that is kind of the future for BYU at wide receiver on full display there. I look at this as an overall, it was a very, very capable opening game for BYU. There is plenty of positives for BYU to build upon as they head into a game against SMU. And BYU should be confident going up against the Mustangs. The Mustangs did pummel Houston Christian 59-7, to taking out some of the frustrations from a very narrow victory that they got the week prior to that over, um, over Nevada. But I don't see anything on tape from me in this game for BYU that leads me to think they're going to go into that game against SMU thinking we got no chance. BYU should be brimming with confidence. This was the type of game you wanted to start your season with and have a positive outcome and have your guys feeling, okay, we're not as bad as some people say we are. Now, is there plenty to clean up? Yes, there's plenty for BYU to work on in the time between now and next Friday when they kick it off against the SMU Mustangs. What are those? What are the things they need to work on chiefly? We'll dig into that momentarily as we roll on right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is here for you guys, no matter what you're looking for when it comes to your small business. You want to find quality candidates. Obviously, they're right for the roles you happen to be hiring for. And that's why you need to check out our friends over at LinkedIn Jobs. They have the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and, more importantly, for free. Think about that. LinkedIn is not just a job board, my friends. It helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job, but might be open uh, to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70%, count it, 7-0, 70% of LinkedIn users do not visit other leading job boards. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. You're missing out on lots of individuals out there. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing many hats and might not have the adequate time or resources to hire adequately. They're constantly finding new ways to make the process easier. 
They just launched a feature that helps you write your job descriptions, making that process even quicker and easier for you guys as a small business owner. 2.5 million small businesses are using LinkedIn for their hiring needs. Why aren't you? Go to uh, LinkedIn.com slash locked on college and post your job for free. You heard that right. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post that job for free. Of course, some terms and conditions apply. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Want to get a full recap of the weekend that was in college football? Well, go no further than our friends over the Locked On College Football Podcast. Spencer McLaughlin will have plenty of reaction for you guys from week one. Uh, check that out wherever you get your podcast. It's also available on YouTube. That's Locked On College Football. Proud partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every single day. All right. Uh, let's talk about what BYU needs to work on in the week ahead. Uh, first thing. Special teams miscues. Parker Kingston, Keelan Marion, got to be more sure-handed when it comes to, uh, obviously, receiving the kicks. Uh, two muffs that I recall off the top of my head for Parker, one for Keelan Marion. That'll be something that I'm sure that Kelly Paping is going to remind them about be- between 30 and 50 times a day until they kick it off against SMU. You got to be more sure-handed. You got to be, obviously, to be able to track that in the air. There were a couple times, the two times, it felt like that Parker Kingston... Uh, mishandled those punts. They were over his head. Obviously, you got to be a better judge of where that ball is going to be coming down and attack it going forward rather than uh, being in reverse in situations like that. I know that he redeemed himself with a pretty nice punt return late in the game, but it's something he's absolutely going to work on. Other thing, uh, Will Farron misses the easy kick but makes the two hard ones. He pushes his first kick 36 yards wide right. Would that allow BYU to have th- uh, 44 points had he made that? But then he bounces back. It's a positive sign for a kicker of his mental fortitude. Makes a 50-yarder at the end of the first half. He added, I think it was a 44-yarder later in the game. So, yeah, you don't want to miss the short kicks, but to redeem yourself in the way he did, that was a positive. But there were some special teams miscues that absolutely need to be addressed and corrected in the coming week. Uh, a couple of you, and we'll get to these comments momentarily from you, our listeners out there, uh, were complaining about the rush yardage and saying that, well, the offensive line looks no different than a season ago. Trust me when I say this. The offensive line looked a lot different than a season ago. BYU's O-line, I thought, had a fairly solid game. Now, obviously, I will defer to Connor Pay when he joins us. Uh, it'll be like Tuesday or Wednesday, I think, is when we'll finally have a chance to catch up with him to get his thoughts on how the offensive line played. But I was sitting in the press box there. I thought BYU's O-line actually opened quite a few holes. My concern with the run game is the vision of BYU's running backs not named LJ Martin. LJ Martin, as I use the term, he's a thoroughbred. He has been born and bred to play running back. He has been trained his entire life to play running back. There is a vision that running backs have, the ability to set up blocks, see those creases and exploit them that he absolutely has. The other guys at running back for BYU, I am concerned, don't necessarily have that. And it's nothing against them. Uh, Speaking mainly of Hinkley Ropati as well as Miles Davis. If you know about their background, and if you don't, I'm going to school you to the game momentarily, is that both of them were wide receivers in high school. Hinkley was more of a slot receiver, did play a little bit of running back, but he'll tell you, I was a slot receiver in high school. Miles Davis never played running back until he showed up at BYU. He was a thoroughbred wide receiver in the Las Vegas area growing up. There is a difference as a wide receiver in terms of what you're looking for than you do as a running back. You have to make split-second decisions, and they've got to be the right ones. And I am concerned that the vision for Hinkley Ropati and Miles Davis made BYU's offensive line look worse than it actually was in terms of its overall performance. We'll get Connor Pay's thought on this, but I'm not trying to throw guys under the bus. I just felt like the vision was lacking at times in this game. Can that be corrected? Yes. With obviously adequate uh, reps, guys can start to realize, hey, I need to exploit that here. Film review will go a long way towards that. I'm sure that Harvey Unga is going to sit these guys down when they go through their game cutups and say, hey, that was the hole there. You hesitated or you missed it or you tried to overrun it essentially and you didn't allow your offensive line to set it up the way it needs to be set up. I am hopeful, and I have a hopeful tone here, is that Hinkley and Miles in particular, they will learn from this. They will realize, hey, you know what? I need to be better about that. I've got to be maybe a a touch more patient in the wide zone scheme, allowing the blocks to get set up instead of being so eager to hit a hole that may not be there quite yet. Or at other times, you can miss the hole. Your, Your vision, like I said, takes you one way, making you think I'm going to go outside here when you needed to cut it back up inside, and you got to have that vision. 
LJ Martin is BYU's number one back. I know that he and Hinkley uh, shared uh, the reps down the middle. 13 carries for the both of them. Uh, LJ had 67 yards against 57 for Hinkley. The nice part is with time and obviously film review and some extra work, I don't think that's going to be an issue going forward. But I do know that the BYU offensive line, based, based on my mentions on social media, they took a little bit of a, of a brow beating from those of you out there. But I would actually point more to the running backs and their vision issues in this game. Once again, don't consider it to be a long-term deal in my mind. I think it will be corrected in time. And if it's not, well, then at that point, you probably look at some other options on that running back depth chart. Guys like Pokai Haunga, Enoch Nawakine, Sione Aimoa, et cetera. Maybe give them a crack. But uh, for the time being, I'm going to count it off essentially as just first game issues. Uh, and we'll hopefully see a better performance. But 47 carries, folks. BYU was very, very impressive in that regard. When you get nearly 50 carries, that's the type of numbers that like option teams get in, in college football. So they ran it a lot, and that was a positive. Oh, one other thing. I'll use that as a positive as well. Remember the East-West action that BYU was so famous for last year and a lot of complaints about their inability to go north-south? If you pay attention to that game, I'm going to go back and watch it in its entirety. I'll have my full film review for you guys on our Monday edition of the podcast. But overall, my thought is BYU going north-south against Southern Illinois was actually far more successful than East-West in this game. That's a positive. BYU is showing that they can go downhill on teams. And I know, it, once again, it's an FCS opponent. It's your weakest opponent on paper. But to go downhill on them the way that they did, I thought that's something you can build upon there in terms of a positive. Uh, a couple other things here that need to be fixed. Got to be able to contain the QB run better. As I mentioned, DJ Williams was the only, I mean, the only threat that Southern Illinois had in this game. And he exploited BYU a couple of times for some big runs, none bigger than that 38-yard touchdown run that he had uh, to give them their second score on the night. You contain that, BYU otherwise had everything else locked down. Now, will they learn from this? Yes, they'll be better with their QB spy. BYU did spy. I saw guys like Sione Moa getting that assignment uh, to spy DJ Williams, but their their inability to uh, square him up when they were spying him, I think contributed to his ability to scramble. He did run uh, for a lot of yardage against BYU, but I think that can be cleaned up with just some extra coaching, obviously getting the right guys in the right uh, sets in situations like that. BYU will be better about that. I think you learn from that as well. And then the final thing that needs to be improved is holy smokes, the officiating. The fact that they overturned a fumble that was a clear fumble in my mind for BYU didn't allow Kalani Satake to call that timeout on that bobbled pass that added 43 ill-gotten yards uh, to the total for Southern Illinois. The officiating, woof, needs to be better. It has to be better, and I'm sure that those officials are going to hear it from their evaluators when it comes to the postgame. There were a lot of things in that game that I don't think anybody's going to be happy about, most particularly those officials. Will they answer for it to any significant degree that we're going to be aware of? Probably not, but man, I thought the officiating and it needed to be better. It was not bad overall, but when they missed a call, they missed a call. All right, so there you go. That's what I would like to see cleaned up. Now it is your guys' time to shine coming up next. What do you guys make of the win for BYU? What do you want to see more of? What do you think was good? We'll delve into all that as much as the comments as we can get to as you roll on right here on Locked on Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. No matter where you're trying to get to when it comes to your events you want to go out to, whether it's a BYU football game, a comedy show, a music concert, no matter what you're into, theater events, Game Time has got the options for you guys. Even a new feature on their app, it's called Game Time Picks, which makes getting the tickets for your favorite live events even easier. It filters out all the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats. You don't have to search through thousands of other tickets to find the right option for you guys. What I love about a Game Time is the app is as simple as it comes when it comes to using it. You can toggle all-in prices. You're not getting surprised by a bevy of fees. You toggle that on uh, the all-in pricing. There's exactly what you're going to pay for right up front. So you see, you know, that's a good price. Good amount of money I'm going to pay. You pick it two taps later, you got the tickets and you're on your way to the event. It's an incredible feature. That's all courtesy of your friends over at game time. So take the guesswork out of buying your tickets with our friends over at game time, create an account today, use the promo code locked on college and get $20 off your first purchase. Once again, uh, create an account, by the way, some terms apply to this, create an account, redeem the promo code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. That's locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time.
Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. If you have not done so already, join the Locked On Cougars Insider Group. We had a great chat going on one-on-one with myself with a number of you during the game. I'm uh, sharing insights as I'm sitting in there in the press box about what you guys want to talk about. If you want that inside intel you can't get anywhere else, join the Locked On Cougars Insider Group. There's a link in the show notes below. Whether you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to it wherever you get your podcast, click the link. Join us. 14-day free trial. Just $5 a month to have the Insider app access that you crave so join us today on the locked on cougars insider group all right time for you guys to have your say on what happened in this game now i can assure you i'm not going to get to every comment between the locked on cougars insider group and our social media reaction i've got north of of, i think 100 messages there's no way i'm going to fit that in the time remaining so let's just kind of roll through here and get your guys's uh, thoughts uh from you guys robert asked this last year a got a lot of grief for his play calling how was this game for you I thought it was actually a pretty solid game. Uh, the thing about it is play callers call plays. Players make said plays. When you have the success BYU had on offense, it makes A-Rod look a lot better tonight. When you had some of the duds that BYU had a season ago, well, guess what? A lot of that blame falls at the feet of Aaron Roderick. I thought he did just fine tonight. So uh, I'm, I get come off. A lot of you have accused me of being an, a homer for A-Rod. So be it. But I thought he had a very, very capable game uh, in terms of his uh, play calling in this one. Uh, other co- comments here. Alex asks this, sol- says this, actually. Solid first game. Got to clean up a bit. Jake looked better than last year when in the pocket, but struggled with accuracy outside of the pocket. That's not a bad point. And he says, Hope's, hope has been instilled so far about BYU. He did struggle with some of his ac- accuracy on the run. I will agree with you on that. He fired high and wide a couple of times, but... When he was in the pocket there, and by the way, the BYU O-line gave him plenty of time to operate inside the pocket for the most part. Uh, Funny enough, at times, it felt like he was so comfortable in that pocket that he actually got sacked a couple of times. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Alex. His accuracy outside the pocket was a bit of a concern, but obviously with uh, coaching, hopefully, and him uh, some individual work, that can uh, be improved upon. Uh, Jimmy asked this, it's not too late to throw my two cents. I have second row tickets, and Jake, as he says, all caps, Holy crap, have those boys put on some muscle in the offseason. Seeing them up close this year as compared to last year, the difference is night and day. BYU looks like a power four football team. You know who you're going to tip the cap to on that one, Jimmy? Tip the cap to Ryan Phyllis and his strength staff. They have worked nonstop, and I mean nonstop, to get BYU's players looking the part, as you mentioned, of a power four team. Now, is that going to yield uh, wins? TBD, but they look, I'm with you. They look the part. They are, they're a significant bulk and just overall definition being added to the frames of these young guys. And it's really cool to see them uh, doing their thing. Our good friend Taylor, my evaluation, besides the QB run, our run defense looked a lot better. I agree with that. Tackling looked good. At times there were some issues. Uh, one player that was interesting to watch was Ephraim Asiata. He is slippery on the edge. He is. Ephraim came in on pass rush situations. He is about 200 pounds soaking wet right now. Uh, but when he comes in on those pass rushes, he he gets after the quarterback. And that's just something you can work with. You need the guys who are going to press the pocket. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, Taylor continues. Jake Retzloff blew me away. What a statement from him. I'm hoping they're also just limiting LJ because he's far and away better than Hinkley Ropati. I think that's absolutely the case. You don't want to run LJ into the ground against the likes of Southern Illinois. Unleash him against SMU, sure, go right on ahead. But SIU, that's not the one. LJ is a different breed of runner, no diss to Ropati. I said it earlier. He's a thoroughbred. He's been trained his entire life as a running back, whereas Hinkley, he has taken to the position since coming to college and junior college. Obviously, he also made the transition. Uh, There is a difference to guys who played it growing up, speaking of running back, to guys who took to the position later in life. All right, biggest thing to focus on, in my opinion, is still the run game. Good improvement, but it's got to be a bigger threat, in my opinion. Yeah, 3.8 yards per carry, you want to see more than that. I'm sure Connor Pay will come on and say that he wanted to see north of four, if not five yards per carry. But the nice part is you got the win. Now you got to clean up some stuff. That's the positive. So I, I still look at it as you're still learning a lot about this team as you move along here. Uh, Scott Simpson, I have a question. Is it a smart move to let Jake play most of that game? I wish we would have seen more of Gary in the second half. Here's my little uh, thought on this. I don't have any inside intel, so this is just me speculating and spitballing here. BYU has stuff for Gary in the playbook as the second-string quarterback. I think most notably QB run, RPO action type stuff to take advantage of his legs. You didn't want to put it on tape tonight against Southern Illinois. Deploy it against the likes of SMU. Deploy it against Kansas State. You hold on to that stuff. You didn't need it in this game. 
Keep it in reserve. Keep it in that playbook. And when you need to unleash it, then it's a real surprise for opposing teams. The SMU team will obviously be spec- uh, looking at everything BYU did in this game. In some ways, keeping uh, Gary, quote unquote, under wraps here, Scott, actually a bit of a, a chess move, if you will, playing chess versus playing checkers. That's just that's a personal opinion on that matter. Uh, Mark Paris, the feeling after this game compared to the first game last year is a night and day difference. Completely agree. It was 14 nothing last year. Remember, BYU opened the season last year going right down the field, punched it in for 7 nothing lead on Sam Houston State, and then the rest of the game mustered just seven more points. It was a, it was a really hollow feeling last year against Sam Houston. No such luck. It's a good feeling coming out of this one. I really, really liked what I saw from BYU. Uh, Josh Glenn, 7 of 15 on third down against an FCS school. Not ideal. Now, you don't want to be sub 50% on third down. I, I, I get that. But the bigger number, 3 of 4 on fourth down. And the funny thing about it is Kalani actually got conservative at times and it bit him in the butt. Remember, they had a fourth and three, if I recall, when uh, they had Will Farron miss that 36-yard field goal. You think Kalani regrets not going for it there? Uh, they were 75% on fourth down. I'll take it. And by the way, one other note, BYU, that first drive, two fourth down conversions on that. I think the fourth down conversions on that drive were as much a statement to Kalani to, uh, from Kalani to his own team as it was the Southern Illinois. He said, we're going to be aggressive. We're going to push the envelope. You guys get the job done. That was a message I think made early on in this game. And I think the team responded very very positively overall. Uh, Brandon Clark, curious what it was like to have a headset on offense and defense. I'll defer to Connor's thoughts on this when he joins us on the podcast because he was there hearing the calls uh, come from Jake who had the headset in his helmet. So I'll defer that answer until next week on that one, Brandon. I, I like that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Spencer Spencer Gonzalez, by the way, a new member of our Locked On Cougars Insider Group, literally mid-game. So Spencer, had a great chat with you. Appreciate your feedback. You, are, you were really welcome to be with us and I'm glad you join mid-game. Uh, love the unis. I thought it was a good uni combo. I agree with him on that. Much to prove on the rest. Sure, there is plenty to prove because once again, this is the weakest opponent on paper. BYU's 1-0. There's 11 more games to go, folks. And trust me, the level of difficulty, it ratchets up to another level beating next week against SMU. So I, I feel like there is, as uh, Spencer says, there's plenty to prove. And I like that. I like the fact there's plenty for BYU to work on going forward here. Uh, let's see here. Other uh, comments. No way this kind of game occurs in the Big 12. How does this translate to the Big 12? That comes from Danny. Uh, that's a good question. I don't think we'll really know until they take on Kansas State. I think BYU, just looking at the, at paper right now, because if you paid attention, Wyoming got absolutely curb stomped by Arizona State in their opener. BYU should be feeling pretty confident, I think, right now going into that game against Wyoming up there in Laramie. Now, playing on the road versus playing at home, that's two very different things. But uh, really, I, think, I don't think that answer can be d- addressed adequately, adequately, Danny, until we actually see them take on a Big 12 team. And that will come on September 21st when they take on uh, the Kansas State Wildcats. Uh, Matt Moon. I'm actually impressed. We over-delivered on expectations, handily beat the spread, and put up a good amount of points. I want to see the O-line dominate a little bit more. They didn't completely dispel all the negative talk. He says, LJ Martin is good. I, I, no disagreement on any of that. I, I don't think anything of that wrong. I think that Connor will tell you he, do, he, he doesn't think that the offensive line performance was anywhere near what he wanted it to be. But there's still plenty of work uh, to, ha- to go. And I'm sure the BYU, they're not going to walk out of that uh, – team room uh, after that game thinking you know what we're we're good we, we figured it all out we, we're we're geniuses that's not going to be the mentality of this team so i thought it was a very solid performance all right uh got time for one more comment here i'm just going to scroll through here uh okay good one here we'll finish up with this from tyson i have a lot more faith in the team after tonight i know that we have a tough schedule speaking of byu but i now believe we can make a bowl game if we can stay healthy It's a very underrated point there. BYU came out of this game, so far as I know, with no major injuries. It's been a relatively injury-free camp as well, sans the injury uh, to Joe Brown with his knee. That is a positive thing. If BYU can remain healthy, they're going to have a fighting chance down the stretch, and obviously we'll see how it all shakes out. Uh, Next week, Friday game, SMU. 5 o'clock Mountain Time kickoff. We'll have plenty of coverage in the week to come. Once again, I'm going to go back and watch this game uh, tomorrow. Speaking of Sunday, it's actually probably going to come out uh, Sunday when you guys hear and or watch this. But I'll have a full recap for you guys on our Monday edition of the podcast podcast 
of my film review. I do it every single game. I go back and watch it in its entirety and write down stuff that I see and learn from a second viewing of the game, if not a third, because I seem to rewind a lot in those film reviews. But nonetheless, we'll have plenty for you guys on our next edition, officially our Monday edition of the podcast. So big thank you as always for all of your support. Once again, over 100 different messages of reaction. Cannot thank you guys enough. We are building a really, really strong community here with Locked On Cougars, and it's all thanks to all y'all. So appreciate all all of it. I really do. And thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first view and or listen of the day. And of course, thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Cougars podcast.